and um, uh, I thought I would speak to uh, a pretty much empty auditorium at uh, 8.30 in the morning, and uh, fortunately it's, it is not the case. This is actually pretty, a pretty good audience for anything that happens in the academic world before 9 a.m. So thanks again. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, so today I'm going to, um, let me give you just a quick, uh, give you a quick anecdote about uh, this uh, presentation uh, a few days ago, a couple of weeks perhaps uh, ago, uh, Cedric uh, asked me if I could I change the topic of my presentation for the conference. And I, um, I said, uh, so if I could give a presentation on something related to networks. Uh, and I said, yes. So this is not exactly about networks as much as um, identifying a variety of actors that essentially profit from international migration. Uh, and profit here, as, as you will see, is used in a, in a sort of narrow, strict way, but also in a, in a looser sense as well. And uh, uh, just to give you a little bit of background on, on this kind of work, let me start by saying that I have been interested in working uh, on, uh, for the past few years, uh, on what I call the migration industry and a few other uh, academics and scholars call the migration industry. Um, so let's start with, uh, with the actual presentation. And uh, what do I mean by, by migration industry? Well, the migration in industry is the ensemble of entrepreneurs, firms, and services, which essentially motivated by financial gain facilitate international mobility, uh, but also other experiences, other practices that have to do with the experience of international migration, emigration, immigration, including settlement, communication, resource transfers, uh, and all of these things that, in fact, uh, migrants have to do and do as they move uh, in, in cross borders. So the specific activities and services and entrepreneurs that make up this migration industry uh, comprise a sphere of changing boundaries, right? This is a concept that uh, has, uh, we could probably agree, a core of activities, uh, but there are all sorts of actors that uh, are more or less in the periphery of this migration industry. And the reason is actually very simple uh, and, and complex at the same time. Uh, migration policies change, states uh, change those policies uh, uh, constantly. Uh, Migra the migratory cycle influences what kinds of actors become more or less important in facilitating mobility across borders. Um, the volume of migration uh, matters and all sorts of uh, additional political and economic circumstances uh, are of significance, are, are, are relevant in order to, to really identify what kinds of actors become part of these uh, uh, migration industry. But we can identify a few of them, uh, and these are some of the familiar uh, suspects, right? You, uh, you, uh, you can identify and, and uh, notice them right away. Recruiters are you know, quite essential, quite important. Remittance firms, travel agencies, immigration lawyers, transportation companies, uh, real estate promoters, and, and Smugglers, all of these uh, uh, actors, actors that actually finance migration, that provide you know, the capital, uh, actors that, uh, and, and, and migration entrepreneurs that uh, uh, can be you know, quite small, uh, but who are very important because they provide the infrastructure uh, to, for example, uh, reproduce uh, fake documents uh, and, um, and so on. So what, what accounts or what explains for the rise of a migration industry? Essentially, in all sorts of migratory flows that cross international borders, not just uh, the you know, classic undocumented uh, or clandestine uh, flows. Well, the migration industry, uh, in fact, arises from geopolitical and, and uh, communication discontinu discontinuities uh, imposed by states and their borders. 
And these discontinuities essentially translate into barriers to mobility, to the transfer of resources and, and information. So it is the existence of borders, the very central topic of this conference, that actually uh, accounts for the existence of uh, the migration industry. Uh, borders, interestingly and significantly for the purposes of, of our conference, uh, are also the sites, they're also the places where many of these uh, services, many of these actors and the infrastructures that they developed are, are concentrated, right? And here, of course, uh, one has to think of borders in a, in a broad sense, uh, not just uh, land borders or coastal borders, but, but also uh, all sorts of places where, in fact, bordering uh, takes place, right? Where the exercise, uh, the, the social political uh, practicing of establishing a border takes, takes place. It can be, uh, in fact, uh, an airport, uh, as Andrea was uh, telling us. Uh, uh, earlier in the conference, it can also be a, uh, around a, the consulate or the embassy of a, uh, of a country of destination of migrants, right? And it is not uncommon to, to go around uh, the world and see many, of, many uh, services, in fact, cluster around uh, the consulates, the embassies that actually issue visas for uh, migrants, but in, in, in many cases also for many other uh, uh, people who cross borders. Now, so far, you can, you can tell from, from the presentation that I'm concentrating, that I'm focusing on facilitators. And the fact is that facilitators are one kind of migration industry. They are sort of the classic embodiment of the migration industry, right? These actors that in fact profit from uh, uh, mobility, from moving migrants around, from the crossing of borders, from circumventing uh, those borders, but also from, from uh, assisting migrants in, for example, navigating the bureaucratic requirements that it takes to cross borders. There are other kinds of migration industries, and I have to, to say, uh, to confess to you in a way, that uh, my interest on these uh, other migration industries, in these other actors, is much more recent, and, and in fact has been pro prompted by my participation in some very fruitful and very interesting working groups um, of colleagues who are uh, looking at these other actors. Uh, of course, we have, and we have been talking, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, about the migration industry of migration control, right? I'll, I'll call it the industry of control for short. Uh, and essentially, it's an industry that, ar that arises from uh, this ongoing devolution of uh, fu control functions. Uh, that states are now putting in the hands of uh, private actors. Um, many of them are large corporations, right, that produce the technology uh, for border surveillance, but also that are uh, uh, taking care, uh, essentially conducting the deportation of uh, undocumented immigrants as they are caught, you know, detained, and returned to their home countries. Uh, there is, depending on where you look at, a big rise in the privatization of uh, detention facilities. In the United States, for example, there is a booming industry of private uh, incarceration, private detention uh, of immigrants, and you know this, this industry or, or this part of the industry of control essentially works like, uh, uh, like a hotel, essentially, right? Uh, the, these corporations basically charge the state, uh, per, a, you know, a fee uh, per person per night, uh, you know, just like, you know, your, your holiday inn, uh, in a way. Uh, there's also uh, something that uh, scholars have called the rescue industry, right? And this, is, this rescue industry is actually very interesting because it's not a, a, an industry in the traditional sense or in the sense, uh, you know, the other industries exist, 
uh, because it doesn't actually charge or exert a profit uh, in the classic sense of the term. It's composed of non-governmental organizations essentially charged or involved in the process of international migration with resettling migrants, saving, saving them, quote unquote, uh, rehabilitating them. Uh, and um, the significance of this rescue industry is that, as you'll see in a moment, it participates at times in facilitation, at times in uh, processes and functions of control, and also works closely then with these, with these other actors. And finally, there is uh, a, a third or fourth uh, uh, industry, which you know, I called an industry, a bastard industry of control. And it's basically composed by, or integrated by actors that you know, traffic, kidnap, extort migrants, uh, and that indirectly, uh, or sometimes directly, facilitate, but also in, 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 in other occasions, in, under certain circumstances, actually deter and, and, and block the, the, the mobility of, uh, of migrants. So, what I think it's, it's important, and the, the reason I, you know, I, I, I crafted this uh, presentation this, this way is because I want to invite all of you to think about this migration, uh, including the migration, the, the migration industry of migration control that we have uh, analyzed and discussed for, uh, over the last uh, two days, not in isolation, but in fact in a, a socio-political context in which these and all the other industries interact with each other and are actually part of a series of alliances and articulations and relations. Theories of international migration have tended to ignore these, these actors. In some cases, uh, we can say, well, the migration industry of migration control is, is relatively new as a, as a salient, powerful actor. But you know, traditional facilitators have also been treated in, in a relatively marginal way and often have been seen as a kind of migrant institution that is essentially as a form of migrant social capital. I particularly disagree with that position because it, it sort of flattens the complexity of relations between uh, these different actors. Um, moving on. So I wanted to uh, start working on, on this issue of the relations, right? The relations, the articulations between the different actors. And I, you know, basically, uh, I'm basically making use of a um, classic, I guess, well-known conceptualization of the relations and alliances between uh, these different uh, actors in the process of international migration. And, uh, and, and this classic conceptualization is Aristide Solberg's uh, Strange Fellow, Bedfellows of American Immigration Politics. And as you'll see in a moment, the, pur the purpose of this, uh, of this conceptualization that Solberg proposed uh, a number of years ago was basically to, to chart and understand the unusual alliances that uh, different sociopolitical actors make in the context of international migration, right? And he, the reason he actually uh, called these you know, alliances, alliances between strange bedfellows was because he, his basic argument was that immigration or the debate, the political debate around uh, immigration actually creates these very unusual analysis, uh, alliances where uh, old uh, enemies or actors that are normally opposed to each other uh, in fact become allies, right? Become strange bedfellows. So, uh, so this is Solberg's uh, you know, old scheme. And it's, it's, you know, it's actually very, very, uh, very, very sort of simple in the sense that he basically argues that uh, sociopolitical actors become involved in migration as a result of their positioning on whether migration is uh, good in economic and sociopolitical terms or whether it has negative uh, implications. 
So I'm going to leave the scheme there for, for a moment, so, just so you can digest it, digest it a little bit. I know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit rushed. But you know, you know, one of the interesting things of, of the scheme is that you can, it, it does recognize the existence of a migration industry to begin with. And actually, the migration industry is represented in this scheme by the actor that is identified in the upper uh, uh, left quadrant, right? It, Solberg actually mentions transporters. Transporters are basically are your classic migration industry actor, uh, historically, contemporarily, uh, closely involved in the process of facilitating mobility uh, across borders, right? And here we can think about transporters who move migrants legally, uh, clandestinely. It doesn't it doesn't really matter, and it basically identifies you know the the. Uh, the, uh, the, the sort of fundamental alliance that uh, the migration industry has with uh, not strange bedfellows, but familiar bedfellows, which are uh, the employers, right? The employers of immigrants in the migration industry are close allies. Uh, strange bedfellows, of course, are uh, co-ethnics and cosmopolitans who might be fighting uh, on behalf of the human rights and uh, labor rights of immigrants uh, who coalesce with employers uh, favoring, for example, immigration reform or increasing the, the uh, quotas for immigration, right? And under normal circumstances, these actors might be at odds with each other, uh, and, uh, but under uh, other circumstances, they, they, come to, they come together. They essentially call us, right? I, there are a number of limitations uh, that the scheme has that you know, I don't have the time to, uh, to arise, to, to discuss with you, but I would like to move to sort of a revised version of, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this scheme uh, as, uh, as I um, come uh, to the end of the, of the presentation. Uh, so let me go to, to the scheme here and basically to, to mention that one of the, there, there are several things that interest me a great deal. <clears throat> one of them is how uh, in, in many settings and many contexts that you look at, uh, nonprofit actors that can be part of uh, Government, non-governmental organizations advocating on behalf of the needs and rights of immigrants uh, often become part of the migration industry of facilitation, right? And the non-governmental world uh, becomes a, uh, a learning ground for many actors to uh, later on commoditize information and social capital and actually launch uh, uh, profit-making ventures uh, that facilitate migration, right? This is a very common uh, pattern that you see in many uh, countries uh, of immigration. You have in the sort of center of the scheme a rescue industry that plays this sort of dual role uh, where at times becomes part of, you know, the, the, the alliances uh, that facilitate migration but often this uh, rescue industry in a number of countries actually participates as part of state-led efforts to regulate, to control immigration, right? And, and what is interesting is that this rescue industry, uh, in fact, provides not only an infrastructure to conduct these types of activities, but also a, uh, the scripts that uh, that allow state actors to justify who gets in and who's kept out, right? There, this is very important. And perhaps not to our surprise, the uh, control industry that you have at the sort of bottom of the, uh, of the, of the scheme here is often allied, certainly in the United States, appears quite close to traditional uh, nationalists and other advocates of restricting uh, immigration. Uh, of course, the arguments that the, for example, private corporations put out to justify uh, their participation as part of a control industry are often sort of technocratic, uh, bureaucratic uh, arguments. But in fact, certainly in the United States, this uh, uh, control industry is very actively uh, financing the political campaigns of um, 
politicians and, and organizations that, um, um, that oppose uh, immigration. So I'm just going to you know, very uh, quickly close by, I already gave you the punchline in a way earlier <laughs> in the presentation, that when we think about uh, facilitation, when we think about these actors of migration, including the control uh, industry, this migration industry of migration control that is, has been mentioned, discussed, and analyzed in, in this conference uh, repeatedly, it's very important not to think of, of, of them and not to think of this industry in, in isolation, but to really make an effort to chart the connections and the relations between this actor and these other actors and other sociopolitical actors of the process of international migration and cross-border mobility uh, around the world. Many of these, uh, and, and just to, to sort of uh, challenge and but also add to Zolberg's famous uh, scheme of strange bedfellows, what are political uh, strange and unusual allies can be often uh, can often actually cooperate and become familiar uh, economic uh, partners if we use a migration industry perspective to understand them. Thank you. <laughs>